Many people who read Pride and Prejudice might come to the conclusion that the pursuit of happiness is Elizabeth's most important concern. Miss Bennet seems to challenge the conventional norms of romance in order to find her joy, ultimately in marriage, to be complete. To an extent I don't disagree, but perhaps the author uses the context of a romance story to convey the avenue by which living a meaningful and happy life is obtained. As such, Jane Austen reveals to the reader the importance character plays in pursuing happiness. As this book was written over 200 years ago, the gap between the past and the present is wide. To best understand Jane Austen's purposes for writing her story, history must be considered. In some way, times haven't changed all that much as people still want to pursue their own interests. But looking through the lens of history gives the reader a greater perspective. A closer look into Jane Austen's world will draw out some of the finer points which Pride and Prejudice is revealing about England's cultural debate regarding marriage, love, and happiness. The very beginning of her novel, being published in 1813, Austen wrote her controversial and memorable opening, leaving the reader no doubt that the focus of the book will be about marriage. Now, the purpose of marriage in 19th century England look almost foreign to us today. Take Mr. Cowns, for example. Jane Austen introduces a character that shows up to the Bennett's home on an announcement from a letter and wants to select a wife. He determines quite reasonably, if one thinks of marriage as a business enterprise, that the daughters of the man who holds the estate he will one day inherit would be eminently suitable young woman from whom he could choose his bride. In this time period, marriage was seen as a way for families or individuals to economically benefit themselves. The man would be able to possibly inherit some property, and the daughter gains a husband, meaning she'll be taken care of financially. Whereas a man's view on marriage might be pragmatic, the woman's view on marriage might be more realistic. Take Charlotte, for example. Her view on marriage was an honest hope at obtaining happiness, but she marginalized her feelings for the opportunity to live out her life in the most comfortable manner possible. When Charlotte was speaking with Elizabeth, quote, I am not romantic, you know, I never was. I ask only for a comfortable home. And considering Mr. Cowns' character, connections, and situations in life, I am convinced that my chances of happiness with him as fair as most people can boast upon entering a marriage state, end quote. If Charlotte is sensible, and we have no indication that she is not, then her view on marriage could reflect England's traditional views towards marriage. As Austen began to speak out in Pride and Prejudice about how one finds happiness, she navigates the traditional views on marriage in England, which was still largely supported by the laws of the land. As such, the inheritance of a father's estate by the eldest son of the family was both the common law and custom in England in 19th and 18th century England. This law shows the property in England was typically passed down to the eldest son of the family, exposing a gender gap. By holding to such a view of passing down wealth only to males, then women would have no special means to support themselves, unless they decided to go against the social conventions. These types of laws perpetuated the institution of marriage as being the sole way a woman could live a comfortable life. Certainly nothing prevented a woman from not entering into marriage, but then she'd be at greater financial risk for herself, as she was a sole breadwinner. Jane Austen was writing in a time that political events around the world impacted England. The American Revolution took place in 1775, and the French Revolution later took place from 1787 through 1799. Writers like Mary Wollstonecraft began publishing books about how the situation and circumstances of women needed to change. Quote, events in France had, therefore, provoked considerable reflection about the way society was organized along class and gender lines. The French example provided hope that those who wanted to extend reforms of the British government, end quote. As the British people were making, as the British people were beginning to understand this new world, English thinkers and writers began to wrestle with the complexities of their society and the individualistic ideals of freedom. This shift began to translate into the views of marriage. Quote, 
The preferences of the individual became more important than in the past, and marriage, while still a contract, started to gain acceptance as an effective relationship, one in which feelings and emotions of the individual were often given more attention than previously before. End quote. Though marriage was predominantly seen as a business affair, this view of marriage, of marriage was beginning to change. Mary Wollstonecraft wrote A Vindication of Women, was critical about the institution of marriage in England. She did not approve of a woman having to be joined of a, with a man to whom there was no love or respect. Quote, the affection of husbands and wives cannot be pure when they have so few sentiments in common, and when so little confidence is established at home, as must be the case when their pursuits are so different. That intimacy from which tenderness should flow will not, and cannot, subsist between the vicious. End quote. To Wollstonecraft's point, she seemed to be throwing together she seemed to see the throwing together of two people in marriage as being counterproductive. As such, a foundation can't foster for an intimate relationship. She is arguing for marriage to be placed on equal footing or perhaps common unity. England's laws concerning marriage favor men to be, favor men to benefit by gaining wealth and immediate wife. Yet women in Wollstonecraft's view gain little from marriage and are actually getting the short end of the stick. Sure, the women's day-to-day -day needs are being, met, are being met, but Wollstonecraft is making a sympathetic and logical argument by looking at the effects of only seeing marriage as a duty. We can infer from her statement that England should consider the impact, the individual impact of those people in marriage rather than just the financial reasons imposed by society. One writer and journalist, Daniel Defoe, and he is a contemporary to this time, by the way, wrote a lengthy essay called Conjugal Lewdness, consisting of 14 chapters devoted to the institution of marriage. The essay reads as a spiritual handbook telling people how to avoid pitfalls and vices, but in chapter 1, remember this is a guy, Defoe begins by taking issue with the current views towards the purposes of marriage. He proposes that people ought to marry for merit, ought to marry for love. DeVoe also writes that the wedding vows themselves support the idea that marriage should be based upon the two people being in love with each other. And to quote the wedding vows, wilt thou love her, live with her, comfort her, honor, keep her, and again to love and cherish. End quote. He emphasizes that the current view of the people getting married, the current view of people getting married is off track and should be brought back to marriage being about love. Because DeVoe believed that the marriage vows were said before God and people, those who entered into the marriage institution should give careful consideration for their reasons. Regardless of the fact that DeVoe was proposing love be, being the divinely sanctioned basis for marriage, the very purpose of marriage was being questioned and the traditional viewpoint challenged. Jane Austen saw this happening and decided to, to wade right into this hotly debated topic. She created a wide range of characters which reflected the values of her own culture. Mr. Bingley falls in love with Jane for her beauty. Charlotte looks for security and settles for Mr. Collins. Lady Catherine wants to marry off her daughter with a merry man, with a wealthy man. I'm not a married man, a wealthy man. Mr. Wickham wants to marry for money. Elizabeth wants to find happiness in marriage. Jane Austen wanted to keep the different stances of, in mix to give some feeling of authenticity to her novel while exploring the competing opinions. But in the end, as all great writers do, Austen set out to add her own voice to the conversation, propelling the idea that character should be the chief measuring stone for, six, for a successful marriage. Three years prior to Pride and Prejudice being published, Jane Austen wrote to her niece concerning her possible marriage to a man her niece had met. In one letter, Austen addresses the importance of character. She explained to her niece that above all else, Character must be considered to be the most important. From his character flows his nature, which Austin wants nothing but the best for her family. The high motivation of personal characters built squarely within Elizabeth Bennet's aspiration for any husband she might choose. 
Jane Austen cleverly wraps this social commentary within the lesson that Elizabeth learns from getting hurt from Wickham. Initially, Elizabeth falls for someone who appears to be of good standing in the community and is good looking, but Wickham's whitewashed persona eventually is eroded and reveals the truth to Elizabeth. She finally admits to herself that she was duped by his confidence, his voice, his manner, and all that had established him to be in possession of every virtue. End quote. Elizabeth is deeply troubled by this relation, by this revelation. Wickham's empty charms force Mrs. Bennet, Mrs. Bennet to look inward and discover the value of characters pertaining to marriage. Elizabeth's moral lessons teach her to suspend judgment and to examine her own experience as she becomes aware of her own affections. This is true. Elizabeth begins to soften her heart towards Darcy, but I believe that her personal growth expands to comprehend the importance of character in finding happiness. This idea proves to be true when Elizabeth learns that Lydia is to be married to Wickham, and she says, small chance of their happiness, and as wretched as his character is, we are forced to rejoice. Elizabeth begins to see that being married is not an end to itself, but having a partner who, have, who is of high character goes hand in hand with happiness. As Elizabeth turns her eyes back towards Darcy, she evaluates his behavior and begins to see him in a different light. She appreciates the way he acted gentlemanly towards her family when news of Lydia's elopement spread. As Darcy apologizes to Elizabeth for his behavior and accepts her reproof, as making him a better person, Elizabeth endears herself to his finally, his newly found humility. His commitment holding to the truth, even when it seemed to cost Darcy, showed his true character. Unlike Wickham, Darcy is a man who is grounded in the ideals of moral excellence. Elizabeth Bennet, in some ways, represents the rebellious spirit towards the conventions of marriage. In a time when new ideas threaten the status quo of using marriage bonds to solidify power and wealth, Jane Austen showed that marrying for love and happiness are important ideas. But she also has her readers consider the significance of moral excellence for groundwork, as groundwork for living a deep and enriching life when entering into the marriage institution. Pride and Prejudice is certainly a timeless classic. One that moves the human heart to believe that good people, though flawed, can emulate the path to a happy marriage through pursuing excellence of personal character. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope that uh, perhaps you'll read Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice a little bit differently from uh, from my thoughts on that book. Um, I could have gone as many other writers have done, many other way, ways to read Pride and Prejudice and write about the different topics. But I felt that um, Jane Austen exploring character is sometimes overlooked when you look at the um, different reviews concerning that book. Um, it seems to be that certainly happiness is a focal point to that, but there's an underlying basis that you should be looking for a spouse who is of good character, um, and, have, and has good moral qualities. You know, they're not just good looking, they don't just have money, um, things of that nature. Anyway, um, again, hope you enjoyed and have a great day.